Some of the master therapists that I referred to that have indicted polyamory are attachment-based relational therapist leaders. And it's easy to see how they came to the idea that you had to have a dyadic relationship to experience secure attachment. And then when you have a client who's experiencing torture and torment due to jealousy, it's really easy to default to that. Well, your problem is this open relationship. But it leaves off a great big truth, which is that people grow in the direction that they want to grow. And if you want something for yourself, you can go get it. But if everybody around you is telling you that thing is impossible, don't go get it. That would be a waste of your time. That really hampers a person's ability to grow without being an extremely independent thinker and independently motivated. Welcome to the Multi-Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're speaking with Martha Kaupi. We will be discussing what it takes for therapists to best serve their non-monogamous clients, some of the most important tools that help make polyamorous relationships thrive, as well as what to look for if you're seeking a therapist for yourself or for your relationship. Martha Kaupi is a therapist, author, speaker, and educator specializing in complex relational therapy, sex issues, and alternative family structures. She trains therapists all over the world to work more effectively with a broad range of sex issues and with clients who are in open relationships. And she is the author of Polyamory, a clinical toolkit for therapists and their clients. So Martha, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So you have been working with non-monogamous clients, clients in alternative relationship structures for several, several years. What finally inspired writing the book for you? Oh, that's such a good question. And it's one I've been thinking about lately a lot as I sort of keep retracking onto why I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, as we probably all should once in a while. (laughs) I I wrote this book because it's hard to find a therapist who's good at this. And um, I really wish that all therapists knew how awesome it is to work with people who are in open relationships. It's a super cool population of people generally with really high motivation, really interested in relationships, really interested in transparency, really interested in consent. I mean, these are ideal clients for therapists. Mm. And so it never made sense to me that therapists don't feel comfortable and don't know how to think about it, except for that the training that therapists get mostly is that only dyadic marital relationships work, which is so overly limiting and reductive and annoying because it's just abundantly incorrect. Mm. So I wrote the book for the therapists who need the education, but I wrote the book for the clients of the therapists who get the education. And then after I wrote the book, I thought, well, geez, not everybody has access. So not everybody can afford a therapist. Not everybody can find a therapist who has experience in this area. How am I going to help them? And my experience of my polyamorous clients has been that they're really insightful really motivated people who are interested in self-help and they're really well resourced in terms of taking on a self-help project. I thought, why don't I write this book for them directly so that if they don't want to go to a therapist or they can't find a therapist or they can't afford a therapist, they can get a therapist's viewpoint about how to think about what the problems that they're coming up with in their relationships might be caused by and what kinds of tools would actually make a difference So that, you know, there's really nothing in this book that I don't use in my own therapy room. And there's not much that I use in my own therapy room that's not in the book. (laughs) So 
it, it's really a very robust guide and it can be used by people who want to sort of step by step go through a process of thinking and looking at relationships a little bit differently. That's funny you make that observation because it's it's true. The polyamorous community loves a self-help book. <laughs> they love that stuff. <laughs> and I suppose that I mean, we could sit and analyze why that is and the factors that create that. But I do think that part of it is that, that essentially good help has been so hard to find for a lot of non-monogamous and polyamorous folk. You know, a good therapist or any kind of good professional for so long has been so difficult and so inaccessible that often all the community has had has been self-help books, not only mm. just about non-monogamy, but also about communication and psychology and things like that. So that is really interesting that that, that stood out to you. You know, I think this is a population who, by definition, values relationships, consent, and transparency, by definition. So already, those are the, that's the self-help kind of foundation. So I, yeah, I really wanted to serve. And I used to be a midwife. I really don't believe in barriers to care. I think the idea that, you know, I went and got a master's degree and so somehow I've got some magic trick that you have to come and pay me a lot of money to get the benefit of so that you can heal or that you can have a healthy relationship is very limited thinking. I really am much more interested in empowering people to get what they need to get for themselves, figure out for themselves what they need and what they want, create the life that they want. and. I have done a great deal of thinking about what makes that stuff actually work, what makes it happen in a healthy way, and what's the difference between a relationship that's working well and that's not working well, and I can break it down for you. So that's that's what I did in my book is really break it down. So if you wanted to see it through my perspective, through the treatment perspective, the helper perspective, you can. I have a question regarding like what essentially gets in the way of therapists being able to effectively help polyamorous clients. And and kind of with that, I, I've i had like past partners who are new to non-monogamy and they'll have a therapist, like you said, essentially say non-monogamy is never works. It's not okay. And they take that at face value and they're like, well, clearly my therapist knows what they're talking about. And so, therefore, I don't agree with this lifestyle or or whatever. So, yeah, I, I feel like that's a barrier to entry. But can you talk about that a little bit? Like, what? Why is it so challenging? I think for therapists to to help polyamorous clients, and and why are they not interested in doing so? I think they're just scared, and mm-hmm. I think that they have a lot of education, and some of it has been incorrect. So in the last couple of years, several very high-level master therapists came out and publicly said polyamory doesn't work. Anything outside of a dyadic relationship structure is not going to function in the long run. It's going to cause it's not possible to have emotional security and safety in a relationship with more than two people. There's just no way that this can work. It's not true. It's It's bullshit. I mean, the reason I did my study that eventually led to the work that I do and the book that I wrote is because my eyes are telling me something different than what I was learning in school. But basically, any therapist who's taken a couples therapy course or has followed famous couples therapists around a little bit has probably had the opportunity to hear some master therapists that are living today who are thought leaders and thought developers indict polyamory. Mm. Uh, and any form of consensual non-monogamy. So then that's a very confusing message. Yeah, that's definitely something I've done the Gottman training. And that's always something that's really frustrated me about the Gottman Institute in particular. And we've complained about this on the show before that they have such good like psychoeducational resources. But when it comes to non-monogamy, they're so just like, no, 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 no. Hard line. (laughs) Hard line. No, 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 no. We haven't researched it. You know, we tried to talk to one swinger couple in the 90s and it didn't work out. So clearly, uh, we don't feel confident about it. Like, uh, you know, even though they have also admitted that I think in the last decade, they've gotten more and more and more and more and more questions about it. So whether that actually inspires them to do some research or not, I guess, remains to be seen. Yeah, some of them have recanted, but not all of them have. And, you know, 
there's more to it, I think, in terms of understanding how this all fits together to make a, a big cultural misunderstanding for therapists. The other part is that the people who come in for therapy, by definition, have some sort of struggle. Mm. <laughs> so, and we're talking about a marginalized population. Not everybody is out. Not everybody, like most people don't know up close and personal, a polyamorous or ethically non-monogamous relationship that's working well. Most people are not lucky enough to get to see that. And therapists mostly see the ones that aren't working. So that is another reason I wrote the book, because I've been so fortunate to know lots and lots of people in workable, open relationships and to help people get from non-workable open to workable open. And so I'm able to put stories of real people's challenges and struggles and redemption, you know, like how they overcame the struggle into my book and give therapists who may never have the chance to see that for themselves, the viewpoint that I have, which is when my eyes are telling me this, I don't care what the Gottman say. You know, mm -hmm. my, my eyes are telling me that this is clearly possible. Therefore, I'm going to discount that part of the message there. Yeah, and that's something that we've talked about for years on this show too of just how as a person doing non-monogamy it's good role models are so few and far between. You know that we don't like even in our fiction we don't have those role models. And, you know and we like we what's weird is we don't even really have many mediocre role models. Like all we have are kind <laughs> of caricatures or or just something that's bad and it's shown not to work. And, and that's starting to change a little bit, but we just still don't have a lot. And so that makes sense that also for the therapists, there, there's also that lack of just breadth of experience of the different ways this can look and how it can work. I know something that I often talk to people about who are new, like who are newly opening up a relationship or getting into a non-monogamous relationship the first time, is this idea of like remembering what it was like to date when you were a teenager, when you didn't have any real lived experience of how that was. So everything was the biggest thing that had ever happened. It was the worst breakup of all time. It's the biggest love of all time. It's, you know, everything is like super high because you have no perspective. <laughs> and I feel like becoming non-monogamous, you go through that again a little bit. And so I could see that for therapists only experiencing it through their clients who might also be new to it, there would be that same sense of like, gosh, this seems too extreme. No one can handle this this level of extremity of their feelings when they're not a teenager anymore. Right. And it also doesn't always unfold in an ideal sort of progression. So it would be great if everybody that wanted to open their relationship would buy a whole stack of books and go through all right. 25 of my worksheets and like hmm. figure it out, think it through, discuss it, talk to a bunch of people who are in open relationships, ask them what the pitfalls are, what have they learned, learn a bunch of stuff about it. But most of the clients that I've worked with who are in open relationships and experiencing challenges did not go about it that way. Instead, they sort hmm. of dove in or fell in sideways or started with infidelity and then suddenly realized, oh, I think I am not monogamous. And, you know, all of that stuff is messy to tidy up in retrospect. And so it's to a therapist who doesn't have a way of thinking about that stuff, clearly, it looks super scary. But to me, I'm still remembering these are clients who are super motivated to have healthy relationships. These are clients who believe in consent. These are clients who believe in transparency. This is very, very different from what I think of as the hardest population for me to work with as a therapist, mm. which is people who have long-term infidelity that was discovered by accident and that involved, you know, very big lies over many, many years and gaslighting. And now the couple wants to make a repair. And to me, I don't know that these people believe in transparency truly, hold it as a value. I don't think they're understanding consent yet. And I don't know how motivated they are for personal growth yet. So hopefully all of that stuff will be in place or will materialize as we start to work together. 
But if I had to choose between one population and the other to work with, I think it's abundantly clear which one I would pick and why. Hmm. That, that's a really interesting perspective. I don't think I've that heard anyone matter. kind of lay out that comparison, but that makes a lot yeah. of sense when you put it that way. Half a, yeah, part of the work is already done. You don't have to start from square one. There, mm. yeah. I mean, a lot of the people that are in our community, they are really very attuned to themselves, I think, in a way that not everybody just is automatically. So that's very interesting. If we're talking about therapists out there who are open to working with consensually non-monogamous clients, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to them? And also because we as humans all have our own sort of internal biases and even therapists do, how do you get over that hurdle as well when approaching new uh, consensually non-monogamous clients? That's a terrific question. We all have bias, of course. And Therapists, hopefully as part of their training and part of their regular practice, think about bias and think about how to handle their own perceptions and thoughts and feelings as separate from those of their clients. And the goals that are relevant in therapy are the goals of the client, not the goals of the therapist. But some people are a little fuzzy on this. And so I help people think it through. I've got a worksheet for therapists and anybody Mm. to start thinking about how they're conceptualizing relationships in general, what their own history is. I encourage therapists to look at the influences on them, what they've experienced. Lots of people have experienced infidelity, for instance, which is one of those things that makes people freak out about non-dyadic relationships, any relationship that doesn't involve just two people seems terrifying because what about all those feelings and what about the lies and secrecy? And it doesn't seem to dawn on people that you could have that without the lies and secrecy. And then Mm -hmm. it would be a completely different thing, you know? So I just, I think when you don't have enough knowledge about something, just getting some accurate information is a really big step in the right direction. But then I think it's also really important to figure out what are the influences on you and what's gone on in your own life that's made it so that this is either easy or hard for you. When I'm working with a client, the more they seem to be like me, the more in danger I am of projecting, the more in danger I am of making assumptions about what they think or feel or want, right? The more different they are from me, the more likely I am to marginalize them. So there, there's a, pro and a con to a likeness and difference. And it's important to recognize both and to figure out where you are when it comes to working with consensual non-monogamies. And then bring that self-awareness to the therapy room with you so that you can handle the thoughts and feelings that are going to come up, which might be in the neighborhood of projection or might be in the neighborhood of marginalization or anywhere in between. Yeah, I I think I just wish that not just therapists, but that everyone thought this way too, of just kind of keeping in mind your biases. And like you said, that that likeness and difference both have kind of their pros and cons is such a such an important concept that I'm just like, yes, that makes so much sense. And I've never thought about it quite yeah, like that. That's great. And I think that's useful for everyone, not just therapists. So I think that's really cool. Awesome. I I wonder about I guess I could call this the reverse, but anti-monogamous bias with certain people or with certain therapists. And I ask about that because, because first of all, it is something that I have witnessed, you know, working with some clients who are working with clients themselves have sometimes talked about having a sense of losing some empathy for monogamous folks the more that they work with non-monogamous folks. And then another aspect of that has been that I've also sometimes had that projected onto me in my work where some people are convinced that I must have an anti-monogamous bias because of the fact that I'm mm. openly polyamorous. I work with a lot of polyamorous clients. And therefore, if someone wants monogamy, there's just no way you know, that they could work with me. Is that something that you have seen be a phenomenon with therapists? Sure. I, I think we all have bias and it is with us all the time. <laughs> but knowing how to deal with it sort of boots on the ground every moment while you're working is the important thing. And remembering 
that the goals that are important are the client's goals is super helpful for staying oriented to that. And also remembering that monogamy and polyamory or swinging or any other form of non-monogamy are not like in an arm wrestling match with each other where there should be a winner. Instead, these are all aspects of diversity. So we want them all and we want more. Like invent if you want it, go get it. Let's invent it. It doesn't have to fit a mold. It doesn't have to be part of somebody's concept. So I actually love when a dichotomy like that shows up because then I can just break it. Hmm. And I think that that kind of East, West, North, South, Black, White thinking is really pervasive and does a lot of damage. So and, and when I'm working with a couple, for instance, is thinking about opening their relationship and one partner wants to and the other partner doesn't, this is a place where this shows up. The fact that I'm able to have this conversation sometimes makes one partner feel like I must be incredibly biased towards non-monogamy or I wouldn't even be sitting here having this conversation. And the other partner wants to feel like I know enough and I'm accepting enough about non-monogamy to do justice to the conversation. But the work for me has to do with removing the polarization of that and asking bigger questions like what aspects of relationship are important to you? Because I think if we start there, what's important to you in a relationship? I don't know, safety, security, adventure, the list goes on and it's individual. You could have any of those in a monogamous relationship and you could have any of those in a polyamorous relationship. But we have a narrative where we believe this thing only exists in this kind of relationship. And we can't get the pieces to start moving in a way that feels like flow until we break up those kind of ideological adhesions and start moving stuff around. So de decoupling all of the weird little connections that are inaccurate helps things to start moving and gets us off of that linear east-west track. So we've talked a lot about therapy from or therapist side of things, but I am curious for myself more because it's been a long time since I've been to therapy. And if I do go back, I would love to try to find someone who has at least an understanding of polyamory for sure. So from that side, from like a client side, what are things to watch out for when you're selecting a therapist? And are there good questions to ask, for example? Certainly. And I don't think this is special for polyamory. I think finding a therapist that's a good fit is a challenge. But when you're in a marginalized population and you're looking for a therapist who's a good fit, the stakes are a little bit higher and there are fewer to choose from probably who have cultural competence. I don't think that the therapist has to be non-monogamous themselves, but I do think that they have to have some kind of way of learning about it and understanding it that doesn't come directly from the client's experience. So the client yeah. can't be the therapist's resident expert you know, so therefore I wrote a book. So I saw just hand it to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just <laughs> hand them the book. <laughs> just say, uh, are you willing to read this book? Because this will be a really good start. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think willingness is more important than expertise. Honestly, I think somebody who is able to say, I honestly don't know, but I know how to find out, or I know how to consult or I know how to do some research, or I will think about it and get back to you is a really important kind of answer. And, and also there are a lot of therapists now who have a lot of experience working with non-monogamies. And so you might very well find one that's spectacular. Mm. And, and I've trained a whole bunch of them. And there are other people who are training therapists to be competent in this area too. So hopefully soon it'll be easy instead of fraught. But always, it's going to be a little hard to find the right fit. What I'm hoping is that soon there will be enough therapists who are good in this area, culturally competent, let's say, so that then you can start choosing unfit rather than cultural competence. And sure. we don't have the privilege of looking for a good fit because we just need somebody who can actually stand 
to sit in the room with us and hear about our relationship problems, right? That's a very different viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. A, that's a very different search. Yeah, it's just <laughs> like I need the bare minimum versus the best fit. Yeah, mm-hmm. wow. exactly. Because there, yeah, there really can be so much variation in that. I mean, based on thinking about my own experiences with therapists and also hearing about friends' experiences with therapists, that there can be such a range of what counts as like a therapist who is willing or supportive of non-monogamy, all the way from yeah, they're super knowledgeable. Maybe they themselves are non-monogamous. They're very steeped in the culture. They're very steeped in the knowledge and in the terminology all the way to they they just, they don't ask any questions and they don't want to talk about it, but at least they won't tell me that it's bad. You know, mm-hmm. there's like such a range in there that where some, you know, some stuff towards one end of that extreme works better for some people versus for this others. But I think that's a really beautiful image to think about in the future, this idea that that kind of care is... It, not just accessible, but like there's choice around it as well, even, even more yeah. choice. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to say that it's, there are some people who have a lot of experience working with non monogamy who I don't think do such a terrific job of it. And I think that has to do with that bias going in the other direction. And, mm. you know, when I was writing my book, I realized I was going to probably be stepping on a number of people's toes by, just coming right out and saying, I disagree with this whole category of thinking. And I think this is possible, even though most of the books you'll find say it's not possible. I've seen it work. So therefore, it is obviously possible. And mm-hmm. I've thought about how to make it work, you know. So I think if a therapist has had a bunch of their own experiences with non-monogamy, and they've run into a bunch of pitfalls, and they've tried their best to work through it, and they haven't been able to work through it in a way that came to a resolution that was satisfying, they may very well be bringing that forward into their belief system now. And I think that it's just, it's important to have a conversation with a future therapist of yours. You know, what's your experience with this? What are your thoughts about it? These are the challenges that I'm facing and that I'm coming to therapy for. Does this feel like it's within your capacity? What are your initial thoughts about how we might look at it? And hopefully even in a 15 minute phone call, you should have a sense like, oh, yeah, they get me. Hmm. And if you don't have a sense like, oh, yeah, they get me, I don't see why you would have a first session. And then I would also assume that you might switch after two or three sessions. If it's still, if it's, you know, turns out to be a super slow starter, or you get into the intensity of it, and you end up feeling like, oh, yeah, they don't get me. You need somebody who gets you or it's going to be impossible to grow. It's a very vulnerable process to let go of narratives and belief systems and move towards what you want. And how can you move towards something that you long for and that you want when you have the sense that your therapist doesn't believe it's possible? Hmm. That's not going to work. On the other hand, you might be able to find a therapist who's never worked with polyamory before, who's just freaking brilliant with the change process, in which case, you don't, I mean, all you need is a good therapist who can sort themselves. You don't need an expert in polyamory. So I think it can kind of go either way. Mm. Well, excellent advice. Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful advice. We're going to take a quick break to talk about some ads, some sponsors for the show, some ways that our listeners can support this show. But when we come back, we're going to be talking about things more on the client side. So stick around. And we are back. So Martha, in this book, you're not just helping therapists get more knowledgeable about polyamory and polyamorous culture, but you also include a lot of information that's very useful, both on the practitioner side and on the client side as well. And as someone like myself, who is both, the book (laughs) has really been a treasure trove of practical information, worksheets, stuff that I can apply both in my work with clients as well as in my personal life. And I wanted to dive into some of the advice that you give just in general for making non-monogamous relationships work and thrive in a healthy way. Now, in your book, you put a lot of emphasis on something known as differentiation. You even have a quote here that I pulled, that quote, polyamory is a pressure cooker for differentiation of self. So for our listeners, can you explain what differentiation is and why it's so important for non-monogamous relationships? Absolutely. Differentiation is a set of skills. And I would say there are four of them, three and a half, maybe. 
And they are first to be able to look inside yourself and figure out what you think, feel, prefer, believe, separate from what anybody else might want you to think, feel, prefer, or believe. The second is to be able to get grounded enough to be able to say that to somebody else, even if you think they're not going to agree with you or their feelings are going to get hurt. And the third is to be able to get grounded enough to hear what someone else is saying to you, even if it's very, very hard for you to hear what they're saying. You don't want to hear what they're saying, and it's hard to hear, to stay grounded and access curiosity. And then the half or the foundation that goes under this is that holding steady part, the get grounded, hold steady, so that right? So to there, it takes a certain amount of groundedness and steadiness to be able to figure out what you think and feel separate from someone else. To say it certainly takes a lot of groundedness within yourself. And to hear somebody else say something tough to you also takes a lot of groundedness. So that groundedness is sort of foundational to differentiation. It's not exactly an aspect of it, but it's foundational to it. And often if a client can't do the differentiation things, it is because they're having trouble holding steady. They don't have the foundation in place. And often that speaks to an attachment concern instead, which I think the solutions for attachment concerns, behaviorally speaking, dwell in the realm of self-management and emotional management and It's very, I think it's super exciting and it's about neuroscience, really, the neuroscience of self-regulation with perceived threat. So we, we think that we're in danger, we have a sense that we're in danger, but we're not actually in danger. This is actually our best beloved, not somebody who's pointing a gun at our head. And so beginning to discern that kind of stuff and react as the current circumstance is accurate is quite a skill set, especially for those of us with trauma in our backgrounds. So there's a journey to go through there and it involves aspects of attachment theory, differentiation, and neuroscience. Yeah, I was going to ask that if you're referring to attachment theory. So, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, and I'm referring to the phenomenon of attachment and the way that we understand it comes from attachment theory. And it's interesting. Just, who did I just have a conversation with about attachment theory and its possible limitations when it comes to multiple partners? Because there's this idea mm. that you can only attach to one person. But we know that that's not true for children, which is where attachment theory comes from, is watching babies and very young children and how they bond and how they know that they exist in the world and how they know that they're important and how they learn to think for themselves has to do with it's relational. It's all relational, looking into their parents' eyes. But little kids can have a different kind of attachment with different parents and they can have multiple parents. And the question I have is what about the village that is for most of us far back in our history and not you know, wasn't around at the time of the research about attachment. We didn't, we weren't studying villages then, but Hmm. my guess is that those kids attached to many, many people and that they just felt safely held as opposed to feeling like they had no safe attachment. I don't think those kids felt they had no safety. Kids that I've known that are in tight communities, for instance, religious communities or dwelling communities feel like they're safe everywhere. And so that's not a lack of attachment. It's sort of a multi-attachment. And Jessica Fern talks about attachment as it relates to polyamory a lot in her book, Poly Secure, which I think is a terrific book and a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Some of the master therapists that I referred to that have indicted polyamory are attachment-based relational therapist leaders. And... You know, it's easy to see how they came to the idea that you had to have a dyadic relationship to experience secure attachment. And then when you have a client who's experiencing torture and torment due to jealousy, it's really easy to default to that. Well, your problem is this open relationship. But it leaves off a great big truth, which is that people grow in the direction that they want to grow. And if you want something for yourself, you can go get it. 
But if everybody around you is telling you that thing is impossible, don't go get it. That would be a waste of your time. That really hampers a person's ability to grow without being an extremely independent thinker and independently motivated. So that's why I think it's so important to let everybody know healthy, securely attached, long-term, multi-partner polyamory does exist in the wild. It lasts over the long haul. It has amazing levels of intimacy. It's truly beautifully workable for some in some circumstances, which is how I know it's possible for somebody who wants it for themselves. Yeah, I did just just for myself, I wanted to clarify with this term differentiation. Is this about differentiating yourself from others or like your thoughts from your feelings or kind of what, where, where does the term come from? What's it referring to differentiating? That's a really interesting question that I'm not sure I have the answer to. It came out of Bowenian family therapy. Murray Bowen is the guy who came up with hmm. the idea of differentiation originally, and he's the founding father of systemic therapy and systems theory. But what exactly the differentiation is, certainly self and other. And self and other could be any other. So it could be, I differentiate from my mother, I differentiate from my father, I differentiate from the God of my childhood, I differentiate from the beliefs of my culture, I differentiate from, you know, whatever. It's about being unique and tolerating differences. And it's so important to be able to do that in a relational way. So this is not quite the same as individuation, which would be sort of I am special and separate, and we're going to go my way or the highway. That's mm. sort of an individualistic ultimatum. Hmm. And instead, differentiation is a relational way of accepting that we're all different, and we can also be connected in our differences. Our diversity is our strength. We do not have to all be matchy-matchy in order to make this work. And in fact, if we are matchy-matchy, it's probably going to be pretty flat, dull, and not very sexy. So all of that is sort of wrapped up in some aspect of my understanding of differentiation. Yeah, I want to give a little shout. Uh, We dove into differentiation a little bit on our episode 334. That was all about good hinge partners. Uh, Mm. where it seems like resoundingly good differentiation is really, really important for people who are in that particular role within a multi-partner relationship. It's interesting that you talk about the individuation being this very like, I'm separate and I'm special and it's my way or the highway. I I think sometimes there's a tendency to lean into that a little bit a little bit intensely, I think, especially among people who maybe identify as relationship anarchists or people who identify very strongly with like no non-hierarchy or things like that. I, I often refer to it as like this emotional libertarianism. Sometimes that's how I think about it. It's kind of like, you know, whatever, I'm doing my thing. This is this is my boundary. This is what I want. You know, people have to have to deal with it. Do you think that along with the strengths that you've seen polyamorous and non-monogamous clients bring to the therapy room, do you see that same tendency towards maybe some very strong individuation as well? Or is your perception of it different? Well, I perceive that individuation stance as being a developmental stage of relationship. Hmm. And so I, I think we all go through that kind of stage relationally. I certainly went through it when I was 18. Didn't I we think, all? <laughs> didn't we all, right? And if, if that completed well, then we may be able to move out of that to something else. And if it didn't complete well, we may not be ready to move on to it. And I don't want to pathologize that decision. I think we can all be different. But what I'm trying to help people achieve is a relational way of being. And my way or the highway is not a relational way of being. It's a individuated way of being. And that's okay if that's what somebody wants for themselves. But if they come to me and say, what I want is for this relationship to work, we'll certainly be talking about the difference between individuation and differentiation there. So I want to kind of pivot to a different topic. I think in, in a lot of the standard polyamory discourse, there's this big emphasis on expressing needs and 
telling other people what your needs are and figuring out what they are and stuff like that. And then also having different partners who are fulfilling different needs because one person can't do all that essentially. So, but in your book, you actually discourage people from framing something as, quote, like a need to their partner. Can you talk a little bit about that and why that is? Yeah, I think that it is not your best strategy for helping your partner be able to hear what it is that's important to you. So if instead Mm -hmm. you can talk about a desire, a preference, a thing that's important, why it's important, how that came to be in you to be an important thing, it feels much less like an ultimatum. If I say to you, I need this, you start looking around to see if you can provide it for me. And and you're aware that it's highly important and that I might reject you if you can't do it. So there's like this little high stakes ultimatum quality to it that isn't actually necessary in most of the stuff that most people identify as needs, quote unquote. So yeah. it's know, like a I language think, difference or a difference sort of just in the language that you're using around that because... Yeah, it sounds like... Yeah, for the purpose of not triggering the limbic system unnecessarily. Yeah. From the department of, I want you to feel heard and I want your partner to really get at what you're saying and why it's important. I'd like you to go deeper with it so that they can understand so that you have a chance of getting it. We need to keep them from getting completely triggered by completely unnecessary theatrics, right? So Mm -hmm. what if we talk about what's important? But again, lots of people learn Uh, something like, I can't express what's important to me unless it's an emergency. And then we have this whole culture around self-care and it's a need, it's a need, it's a need. And I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying we have language for this. We have language that can help us express something way deeper than I need this or I need you to do this. Instead, I wish this, I want this, I prefer this, this feels very important to me. In my ideal world, it would go like this. And by the way, what do you think? How would that be for you? And now we're getting relational. What's your side of this? What? How do you perceive this? How does it land for you? What are your thoughts about it? What do you want for yourself in your life? Now we're having a relational conversation. Sorry. Gosh, I feel like we yeah. could do a whole episode just, just on, on that. that. That was excellent. Yeah. Because it, it comes up when we talk about things like boundaries as well, that I think a lot of people go through this thing where they kind of realize, oh, I've been, you know, sort of allowing a lot of situations in my life that that are harmful to me and that I don't want. And they learn about boundaries and then they kind of are like, oh, well, if something's a boundary, then I don't have to feel bad about needing it like a need and it can kind of get used in this ultimatum sort of way before kind of learning well okay hang on though there's this difference between what's truly a, a boundary boundary or a need versus this is what i want and that's it's important a preference it's like yeah. we get this thing that's like if i want it that's somehow not important and if i'm not getting it that's not a good enough reason to leave this relationship and it's just it's like all these beliefs sort of compounded on top of each other that make it so we almost feel like we have to say I need it or we have to say it's a boundary because otherwise we couldn't even ask for it or we couldn't even take ourselves seriously. But you said the word theatrics, which I, that really resonated (laughs) for me because sometimes it is just that or, or a partner will, will view it as that just based on, you know, the situation or the circumstance that you're in, even if, to you, it feels fairly innocuous. So that's really well, fascinating. Or it might feel life and death important to you. Sure. And because I want you to feel heard, I'm going to encourage you to use language that's going to make it easier to hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And to respond well. The other thing about this kind of ultimatum y feel that really ends up shooting you in the foot is it really brings out an opportunity for conflict avoidance on the part of the partner. So let's say you say to me, Martha, I need blah, blah, blah. And I'm kind of conflict avoidant. I'll be like, oh, oh, shit. She's going to leave me if I don't, you know, meet this Uh need for her. This is really, I got to do, yes, 
And I'll say, yes, of course I can do that for you. I've never been able to do it before in my whole entire life, but I'm sure this time I will be able to do it for you. And so I'll either pull out magical thinking or I'll mm-hmm. say, yeah, yeah, I'll be kind of dismissive. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Right, right, got it. And then we'll move on. Or, and I may already know I'm never going to do it or I don't even believe in it or I've never made that work in the past and it takes some real magic to imagine that it's going to happen again. And any of that is really selling you short. Because what you need, what all of us needs is a partner who's strong enough to agree and disagree. And so now we're back to differentiation again. So this is why it's such an important relational skill, set of skills. If you can't figure out what you think and prefer and desire and say it, you're not going to get it. And you're not going to make a good agreement. And if you don't make good agreements, you're not going to have security and safety in your polyamorous relationship. And if you don't have safety and security in your polyamorous relationship, something's going to go wrong for sure. Well, that's a perfect segue because we wanted to talk about agreements on the show for the past seven, eight years, however long the show has been going. You know, all the time the conversation comes up about like, agreements versus rules versus boundaries versus like a relationship contract versus whatever other kind of like structure or, you know, terms of engagement that is popular in the zeitgeist at that particular moment. And we want to hear your take on the whole agreements versus rules versus boundaries versus relationship contracts, kind of what you've seen that actually works really well for people. Well, we're well on our way here because we've talked about differentiation and we've talked about needs versus desires. So those are foundational concepts to making a good agreement. We've also talked about conflict avoidance, which is foundational. So conflict avoidance and also reactivity, those are challenges with the third part of differentiation, the hold steady when somebody else says something that you don't agree with and that you're not comfortable hearing, to lean in with curiosity. So If you can't do all of the parts of differentiation, it's going to be very, very difficult to make and keep an agreement. So when somebody says, I want this in my relationship, and they're looking at their partner and they're saying, this is what I want. If I'm there, like in a therapy session, I'll say, time out, and I'll look at the partner. I'll say, thank you for sharing, and then I'll look at the partner. And say, now your job right now is to look for yourself. Hmm. So you heard what your partner asked for. That's fine. Just set it to the side for the moment and just take a second and get in touch with yourself. Can you find you? Can you feel anything inside of you that is true for you? Do you have a sense of this would be easy for me? This would be hard for me. I believe in this. I don't believe in this. I'm interested in this. I'm curious about this. Why is this important to my partner? What you got? But what I want you to know is you do not have to agree. You do not have to give it to them just because they asked for it. The only thing that I think is really important for you to do right now is only be honest. This is not a good time to bend the truth. So But you can disagree and we can have a big flipping fight about whatever great thing, but it's a real conversation about what's actually true for you. That's what I'm here for. And that's what a good agreement is based on. Something that you really can bring yourself to, not because your partner wants you to, but because you want to. And you might want to primarily because your partner wants it and they're important to you. But there's, it's got to sort of tap into something deep that feels almost like a value if it's not going to just come naturally, right? There's the easy agreement. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would never do it differently than that anyway. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the hard agreement, the one where I'm going to be tempted 50,000 times to break this agreement and I'm going to need some real muscle to be able to keep my agreement. That agreement is the one that I'm worried about. And that's the agreement that I want to make sure is formed well. I just, I feel like so often what we see when people talk about agreements in specifically when opening up a relationship, because that's usually the first time people even think about having agreements in a relationship. But so often they're, they're not that. You know, so often it's the agreement is that one person said they needed a thing 
or or just that this was important and the other person didn't like it but was like but I want to be in a relationship with them so okay and there's not that sense of a value behind it sometimes it's even like the opposite of a value they might have they might actually think actually my values would lead to a different behavior than that but but I need to somehow compromise and I guess compromise is a good quality right so I should do that it's like that's I feel like that's how it actually gets approached so often. It does. And it's funny you bring up compromise because I don't believe in compromise. Hmm. And it's one of my sort of more out there stances among many things that I just disagree with a lot of people about. I imagine I within the therapeutic circles also, like right. those are some yeah. fighting words. And, yeah. <laughs> yep. It's true. But you know, so to me a compromise is where I give up a whole bunch of stuff and you give up a whole bunch of stuff in the hopes that we can meet in the middle somewhere so that neither one of us is satisfied and we're both resentful. Mm. What could go wrong? And, you know, instead, I believe in a different, a whole different process that's less linear. So we're not going to organize ourselves on your way or my way continuum and then try to find something in the middle. Instead, we're going to try to populate a vast field of possibility. And the way we get there is through curiosity and creativity and playfulness and empathy and validation and safety. And then all of these possibilities begin to materialize. It gets very fun and exciting and creative as our minds kind of crack open and we realize, oh gosh, there are possibilities that I never even thought of before. And then something very magical happens, which is that some decisions just kind of present themselves. You don't mm. even have to make them. They just develop out of this shared understanding and enjoyment of what's important to you and what's important to your partner or your other partner and all the people. So I don't believe in compromise. I kind of more mm. believe in magic, that kind of magic <laughs> that happens when you create something that you didn't know could happen before when you create something that you couldn't have imagined before you start this relational process. And really, that's the beauty of relationship. We are more than the sum of the parts. If we do this well, then you make me more and I make you more and the other ones make all of us more and it just is more. And that's so foundational to why people are even interested in polyamory in the first place. The idea that love is not a limited commodity, there it more makes more. Well, ideas aren't a limited commodity either. And ways of structuring a relationship also not a limited commodity. So I think that this is part of, I mean, you're getting an idea of how I think about agreement making. It's quite... <laughs> different. It's vast. What do you want? And what do you need? And what do you need? And now let's hash it out. And then let's write some stuff down on a piece of paper. I just think, whoa, that is not going to work. And mm. I'm worried about every single one of those agreements, because they're about to be broken agreements. And once we have broken agreements in a relationship, we do not have emotional safety and security. And we need it. We need everybody to feel nurtured and safe and welcome and wanted and important and valued. I had a comment, but I don't feel like I can follow that because I think that what, what you just like... said was just like so solid and inspiring yeah. and wonderful. And so I think I'm just going to leave it there. So Martha, it's been fantastic to have you. Where can our listeners find more of you and your work and your book? Uh, the biggest, best place to find me is in my book, which is a great big book that talks exactly like I talk to write to you. It looks like a big fat textbook, but it's super readable. And you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on independent booksellers. It's available in the UK from several booksellers. And you can find links to all of that on the book page on my website, which is instituteforrelationalintimacy.com. And again, for people, that title for Martha's book is Polyamory, a Clinical Toolkit for Therapists and Their Clients. Highly recommend. I got a review copy, but I even went and bought 
another copy because it's just that good. good. So I highly recommend (laughs) to both the professionals and non-professionals out there. So we are going to be sticking around with Martha for our bonus episode for this week. We're going to be talking about monopoly relationships and also talking about managing NRE. So if you're a patron, you can stick around for that. And on our Instagram, we want to hear from you. We want to know how do you cope when a partner tells you something that is difficult to hear. So you can go check out our Instagram stories to answer that question. The best place to share your thoughts with other listeners about this episode is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanetta. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. The research assistant for this episode is Dr. Kiana Nurse. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 